um, so one of my favorite quotes at the moment is, uh, it's difficult to make predi predictions, especially about the future. Um, and uh, so what we would like here, it is billed as a conversation. So what we're very keen uh, it to do is to it try and make it as interactive as possible and try and have as many questions as, as they come up. We're quite happy to take them as they come. Um, Russell's mentioned um, the extremely experienced gentleman either side of me. Um, don't be fooled by their boyish good looks and youth. They've been around for years, um, particularly in China. Um, Alistair spent many years there as an investment banker, and Carson obviously based here in Hong Kong, and I'll, I'll let them say a little bit more about their experience. But um, the, f the first part of the question is China Watch. What happens in China doesn't stay in China. The inference being that historically China has been quite isolationist. In recent years, I think I moved here uh, over five years ago now, that has massively changed. China now plays a very crucial role in global and regional growth. I think we're going to be encouraged to look at One Belt, One Road, FDI, all those areas. Um, we're going to take a series of questions and then, as I say, welcome for your comments as well. So the first, first question that we'll take, uh, which will lead us naturally in, is what is happening in China? And, and in particular, around the economy, um, is this period of growth that there's been over the last 30 years, is it a one-off catch-up? Or is it likely China's going to continue outperforming the rest of the world and take its place as an advanced economy? Carson, if I start with you. Uh, yeah, there are some numbers that I just saw this morning. The producer's price index rose 0.1%. 0.1% in September. That's the first time since uh, 2012. So you see that the X factory prices actually since the last month has come up. And that, that in a way is an indication. Number one, an indication that things are not quite always as gloomy as the uh, media has talked about. Secondly, also, what what's begins in China doesn't stay in China. Don't, don't uh, predict predictions are sometimes very difficult because there are so many moving parts within uh, in the Chinese economy. Uh, some may be uh, political, some may be uh, policy, other than polit political as, as to power, policy in terms of how the country, how the leadership wants the uh, country to move. Some will be export driven, some would be domestic demand driven, some would be uh, industry driven. Uh, it, some industries can, uh, right now, uh, over the past week, you see the Chinese leadership trying to cool down the uh, real estate sector again. I mean, th this has been going up and down, and the reason, of course, is uh, real estate. Uh, when real estate prices go too high, of course, it's a livelihood issue. But real estate also carries with it uh, an entire supply chain. That once real estate starts coming down, all sorts of industries in China also start com coming down. So you see the government policy about real estate kind of like roller coasting, and you know, the, uh, the, uh, the policy of the day looks as though China is now trying to control uh, real estate related uh, 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 loans, uh, again, to somehow control the uh, growth in real estate prices. All these policies in terms of particular industries would again affect things like uh, like uh, total uh, industrial output, uh, pricing, inflation, etc., etc. There's really too many moving parts in China for any single statistic to, to be all telling. Alistair, uh, that was quite a lot of ground covered there, Carson. Um, IMF reports uh, using phrases like uh, debt in China has riven, risen at a dangerous pace. There is a potential financial calamity. Um, phrases like debt addiction being used. What's your view? Well, when I'm asked that question, I um, usually throw it back and say, um, for as long as I can remember, certainly for more than 20 years, um, people have been predicting that uh, you know, the debt pile that is accumulating in the US is unsustainable. 
but um, yet it continues. And um, you know, US bonds uh, continue to attract investors from around the world. So I don't give a lot of credence to the, um, uh, the suggestion that China is about to implode um, through a load of debt. Um, I think that's way, way um, out, out of line with the realities. And um, going back to one of the earlier speakers today, um, when you look at the way in which you know, China has rebuilt its uh, infrastructure from a very, very um, poor base over the last, uh, well, effectively, you know, since uh, 1949, um, you know, this has created a platform for growth which is really unparalleled anywhere in Asia. Um, uh, another speaker referred to, to India um, at a stage maybe 10 years behind China. I think that's a very accurate assessment. Um, let's, you know, look at Hong Kong. I mean, the perfect example of how you accelerate growth through infrastructure, which is largely built on debt, um, is our own little escalator. Um, those of you who've lived in Hong Kong for many years will recall back in the uh, uh, pre-escalator days, the area which we now call Soho um, was basically uh, peopled by small enterprises, by uh, um, little workshops and so on. And um, now it, it is a vibrant commercial center full of restaurants and boutiques and hotels and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, it may sound trivial, but um, the effect of, uh, you know, building infrastructure um, and the Belt and Road, of course, is going to be infrastructure on a massive scale across Eurasia. Um, that is all going to underwrite growth. And, you know, debt is a natural complement of that. Can it be serviced? Um, the answer, I think, is, is, is yes, or at least um, I have every confidence that in China it will be serviced. So you're getting slightly more granular into what's happening in China and to maybe even link it back a little bit to, to the last presentation on, on, on the Bank of Asia. Um, in particular, we've been looking at technology, uh, especially Wi-Fi. Um, the, the panel you and I were on last year, actually, Carson, what came out very strongly is how China believes that there is the ability to innovate and possibly miss out the bricks and mortar stage and go straight to the end, um, if you like, electronic stage and digital commerce. Um, what's your view on that, Carson? Oh, that leapfrogging is absolutely one of the uh, achievements that we've seen. Uh, uh, now, of course, China's uh, Internet Plus. I mean, if you, if you look at what Li Keqiang, the Prime Minister, has said, let's China restructure its economy, and Internet Plus has been the byword. For an Internet Plus meaning not just the Internet, how, how we do our e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera, but adding the Internet to the medical services economy, adding the Internet to a particular part, so everything could be Internet, and, and that could be a driver of the economy. And, and I see um, Alibaba has to be helped, has to be the world's largest e-commerce operator. So uh, these are all things that have been proven that China leapfrogs very well. And the internet, the, the digital economy is a major driver of that. But not just in the digital economy, you look at China's environmentally related green tech. China, I, for among other things, I, I'm chairman of the uh, task force on uh, green business of the UN for, for Asia. And so I, I do, uh, on a regular basis, every half a year meet with uh, leaders in different, you know, the, the wind, the, uh, the solar, the geothermal, geo, uh, uh, biofuel, whatever industries. And China, China is doing a lot and, and, and cutting edge uh, businesses in, uh, in the green sector, and there are so many other sectors. Uh, virtual reality, um, my nephew, for example, set up a uh, new private equi equity fund uh, on TMT, and within the six months, he bought into three virtual reality companies in China. It's a thriving, thriving sector out there in China. Talk about any latest uh, development in, uh, of course, drones. I mean, China now, the company in Shenzhen produces the largest number of drones in the world. Talk about any new cutting-edge technology. Someone from China, some companies in China, 
is there. And not only there, maybe a leader in that sector. Yeah, it's been interesting, actually. It's a couple of years ago, we acted on an acquisition, um, an investment into a drone, drone factory by uh, quite a well-known electrical business. Um, so what, what, what do we take away from that? I mean, it, the Bank of Asia is interesting because it is, is, it is going to, or is trying to be a disruptor. And going into China, it's very important. The, 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 the people there expect to have um, new technology to work with. And so BVI and all of us businesses that, that, that represent BVI and are involved in it need to, to keep on the front foot with that, I suppose. That's right. Um, in a former panel, about a year ago on some other panel, I, I was using statistics that show that China has 20, and, and uh, because it's a year old and I haven't revisited the numbers, I think China has 30, 20 some 30% 30 of the global mobile uh, um, uh, economy. Uh, no, 20-30% uh, of the online population in the world and something like 30-40% of the mobile population. In any event, the number of people using mobiles, the percentage is highest, in the absolute number and the percentage is highest in the world. So if so many Chinese are mobile enabled, then the using the digital uh, means to do your banking, to do anything else in your life is so much easier and to push in China than in other parts of the world because the device is in so many people's hands. Thanks, Carson. So um, just moving it on a little bit, um, the title suggests what, what happens in China does not stay in China. Of course, certain things will. Um, real estate isn't going to move out of China, as far as I know. Um, pollution, um, issues with property values you, you've already spoken about. Um, what part do you think the BVI has to, to play in that, Alistair? Well, I think uh, earlier on we heard that you know, BVI, and I think it was from Vistra, has been um, an absolutely essential ingredient in China's overseas expansion. And without the facilities that BVI, um, you know, a well-regulated corporate environment, provides, um, whether it be for companies who want to list overseas or who are contemplating M&A transactions, um, it's, it's been an absolute um, support of uh, Chinese expansion, and, and that, of course, is, is slated to, to continue. So, um, of course, the number of registrations has, um, uh, has began to uh, recede, um, and that's in response to a number of factors, including, as we've heard, the difficulty of opening bank accounts and so on. But, you know, the overall trend is certainly not going to change. Um, I mean, China is going to continue um, to expand globally. Um, maybe the number of transactions will be slightly less, but the size is certainly going to be very, very substantial. And for those transactions to be completed in an orderly and efficient fashion, I mean, BVI clearly has a very important role to play. Uh, if Bank of Asia can facilitate those transactions, then, you know, clearly that is going to be to the advantage not only of BVI um, in terms of capturing uh, the largest slice of the uh, Chinese overseas growth, um, but also to the Chinese consumer, the Chinese entrepreneurs, um, who uh, will increasingly come from areas that we've never heard of. There will be names that are not familiar. Um, as Wayne said in his presentation, a lot of these guys um, are new wealth. They're people who've made their money in the last 10 years who don't have a great public persona but have great ambitions um, and ambitions which are fully supported by the government to expand overseas, um, both in terms of seeking technology and, uh, and resources. So uh, both of those factors, I think, uh, you know, really play to the strengths of BBI. Um, not in a way that suggests that we should be complacent, um, because there will be a lot of challenges. Um, but you know, it is, to my mind, a very clear trajectory for growth, in which BVI plays an essential role. So you you, you touched on there um, what will happen outside of the BVI, and so let's just 
start to have a, a, a bit more of a think about that. There's a couple of interesting statistics I've picked up recently. The, the, the first one is, is the heading Chinese banks eating Wall Street's lunch in Asia, um, which is quite an, aggressive, uh, quite an aggressive title. But the, the, the point of this is, and we see it reflected actually in, in, in our practice as well, um, if you look at the deals that are being done and, the, and who is actually on the investment banking side of these things, uh, as, as recently as two years ago in Asia, um, the list of the top 10 banks was, um, it, it was a Wall Street who's who. Um, right now, um, the top five are, are Chinese and they've got 60% of the market share this year. But I'll do it, um, if you uh, take the calculations and reports from Deal Logic, which I, th I think is fascinating, but as I say, very much reflected in, in, in what we've seen in our practice. Um, the other, I think, very interesting um, statistic is that China's now overtaken uh, the US in terms of outbound M&A uh, for the first time in the first nine months of this year. Uh, ag again, information from Deal Logic. Uh, that's an increase of 68% of, of on, on the nine months uh, uh, last year, um, which is quite incredible growth. Shall we have a talk about um, w w what, what is happening and, and what the effect is going to be outside? We've already seen uh, Chinese banks becoming stronger. We've seen more investment being made in other parts of the world. Um, Carson, ha where, where do you see it heading? Um, I have sat on the uh, Chinese uh, National People's Congress for three terms. And in fact, going out is not a new topic. It's been a, a policy statement for, well, the, the last seven, ten years. So uh, Chinese companies going out is a, is a, is a policy-driven as well as economics-driven um, uh, trend and unstoppable. Uh, and what are the Chinese going out to buy? There, there, was, there was an interview some time ago with FT, I think, and they say, Carson, what, I, and I'm an M&A lawyer, uh, why, why are the Chinese going out to buy things? And what are they buying? Effectively, the Chinese are going to, to out to buy things that we can't find in China. We don't have enough in China. So the oil and gas, the natural resources, are of course, what we need. The international distribution system is what we need. Uh, for example, IBM, many uh, Lenovo years ago buying IBM. That's because IBM has the brand name and has the, uh, the uh, internet, the market that Lenovo could buy buying IBM uh, earn. Recent years, you see Chinese going out to buy food. Um, the Smithfield deals, the, the cheese deals in Israel, the uh, dairy deals in Australia, New Zealand because we don't have clean food in China, and therefore we have to go out and buy those. So look at what China buys, and, and I say, hey, also see whom Xi Jinping met when he goes out on his international tours. Some deal is going to happen there in that country where the presidents meet, and, and lo and behold, of course, China does deals in Tehran, does deals in Egypt, and, and part of those will be kind of like uh, top-end government enabled transactions, but most of all where there's a strong demand at home and with a uh, increasingly open uh, 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 a, uh, population that's increasingly informed about the rest of the world, partly because of the uh, internet-enabled uh, knowledge. Uh, China wants a lot more things than the, the Chinese want a lot of things like clean food and from where that they did not know or did not uh, aspire to in the past. So uh, this, this huge demand in China for, for higher quality whatever is another reason why China is going out to buy so much. And of course, there's a foreign exchange. Uh, in the past, most, a good deal of China's foreign exchange is spent on holding U.S. treasuries. And of course, the government knows that this is not exactly the smartest thing you do with your foreign exchange. So go out and buy resources instead. Yeah, certainly the history has been the purchase of US securities, right? 
Um, and that looks like it's changing to foreign direct investment. And ju just by way of, of example, you were talking about Xi Jinping and the, and the visits that he's making. I understand last week he was in Cambodia. The next day, Friday, he was in, uh, he was in Dakar in Bangladesh. That's the first visit from a Chinese head of state in 30 years to Bangladesh. It's not by accident. But um, uh, Alistair, could, could you give us a, a, a bit of, of an idea of some of the, you know, the, the, the policy reasons we were, we had a chat a bit earlier about the, the Gorbachev phenomenon that they're trying to, to avoid? Sure. Well, I think um, in the back of everyone's mind in, in China, it's certainly uh, amongst policymakers, is the uh, example of what happened in Russia, um, actually starting under Yeltsin with the, you know, the first privatizations. And, um, you know, they looked at that whole process very, very carefully. And, um, you know, clearly um, it worked out in a way that was not, shall we say, to the, uh, uh, the public's greater benefit. Um, it resulted in, uh, you know, power uh, monopolies over a number of enterprises falling into individual hands of what have become known as the oligarchs. And um, the economy overall has suffered as a result of that. Uh, I think China, you know, is very, very conscious of uh, precedents in other countries. They learn very quickly from the mistakes that others have made. And therefore, the, uh, the process of change, particularly regarding state-owned enterprise reform, is taking a very different shape in China. Um, we're not going to see um, the sort of wholesale privatizations which a lot of people predicted um, from a document which was issued in 2012 um, called the decision, where um, you know a, a lot was made of the phraseology um, regarding market forces playing a much stronger role in the uh, uh, evolution of state enterprises. Um, that is not going to happen, and we've seen recently the uh, debt for equity swaps, which uh, is the new sort of paradigm, if you like, for for SOE reform. Um, I mean, personally, I have a lot of reservations about it. I, I don't see that it is going to create huge uh, uh, efficiencies in state enterprises if you put, you know, a company like Bow Steel together with, uh, which is a very well-run and successful company, if you put that together with Wisco in Wuhan, which is um, a basket case in terms of uh, uh, it, its, uh, its profitability and its management, um, does that create a better whole? I think probably not. Um, even with the participation of a third party, um, and they're bringing in, as you know, a new um, regime of asset management uh, or asset managers um, to help the process of change. Um, it's going to be a very, very slow, drawn-out process, and uh, you know, clearly, is not going to be successful in every case. But it's an example that you know, China um, works, as, as Deng Xiaoping, you know, famously said, by stepping on the, uh, the stones to cross the river one by one. And um, sometimes that means taking a particular approach, uh, which proves unsuccessful, in which case they will revise their view and they'll try something else. So that experimentation and ability to experiment, um, I think, is, part and, uh, is one of the more unusual features of the way uh, in which governance um, operates in, in China. Um, so, uh, we're not going to see, I think, sort of cataclysmic changes in terms of the, uh, um, the strength of state enterprises in China. But we are going to see um, this huge pent-up demand from the uh, class of entrepreneurs, the new class of industrialists, the people who are investing in technology in the West. Um, the example, for example, of KUKA in Germany, the robotics firm which uh, has just been acquired. Um, to take China very rapidly up the um, up the technology curve. Yeah, it's certainly something we've seen reflected in our practice. We were uh, acted on, for example, Weetabix and, and various other brands that have been been bought over the years. So it, it's an interesting thing. I, I I quite quite like the fact Carson says we we buy things that that, that we don't have in China. You have football clubs in China. Some, some <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the no. How many more football pl clubs are going to be bought by Chinese entrepreneurs? Well, I, I just President wonder. President Xi has professed to be a fan of, uh, of football, <laughs> so I think uh, quite a few more will be bought. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, it all sounds fantastically rosy, um, apart from um, obviously these recent government 
statements uh, effectively saying, look, if you're doing these debt for equity swaps, you've got to stand on your own two feet. Um, wh wh what are the difficulties? Um, looking at some of these deals, and again, there is public information on this, there's about US 10 billion of, of deals, of China outbound deals that, that haven't closed. And there are issues around uh, national security, particularly around technology. In the US, uh, in Australia, the, the, there's issues around lamb rights, uh, the Kidman cattle estate. There's Lee Car, Lee Car uh, uh, attempted acquisition that we talked about. Controversially in the UK, we've had a change of uh, leadership at the top of the Conservative Party. And there was a re-examination, although actually it's now got, got the green light, on the Hinkley Point, uh, Hinkley Point nuclear power station. Um, what, what other issues are out there, Carson? Uh, uh, quite a bit of that would be political. Political, not necessarily in terms of the top leadership, political in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the powers that be in Washington and other places, probably Washington. CVS is obviously uh, an issue that uh, Chinese companies are very conscious of when they do acquisitions in the US. And my typical way of answering them is go find the right lawyers, of course, who can, who can deal with CVS uh, more effectively. And again, CVS is not necessarily a White House. Why that is, is, is all the stakeholders uh, in, the, uh, in, in Washington and, and New York and elsewhere that, that affect uh, CVS decisions. And um, and the the stronger the China become China becomes the more aggressively China goes out to make acquisitions, the more the uh, the resistance and the uh, the concerns because uh, if a country suddenly starts buying up a lot of very uh, high profile assets across the world, then necessarily that would cause concerns and necessarily the politicians have to respond. Um, uh, and Hinckley point, I, I, mean, I presume it's, again, there would be political considerations, but again, uh, it was politically resolved. Um, uh, so politics would be, would be a key part of that. But again, in doing deals, if there, there are ways to deal with CVS questions, like carving off certain, f uh, so th I, I think, uh, for example, there was one uh, acquisition by a Chinese company of something in America that involves uh, one of the assets of the company being acquired, being close to a naval base. And I think at the end of the day, that asset was, uh, was cut off and the deal got closed. I mean, there are ways to structure a deal to make it uh, acceptable to, to CVS and, and to the media, et cetera, et cetera. There is a takeaway there, though, that if BVI, for example, is, is being used in these deals as a conduit, um, it needs to have good relationships with governments. So, for example, as is going on this week, going and, and, and making these visits up, up to China and, and having conversations with, with uh, some of the government officials up there is a very important thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think the BVI is working very hard. Uh, uh, on that, and the premier and the delegation will be on the road for well over a week in China, and uh, the, the government has to be commended for 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 working so hard in building those relationships. Yeah. Alistair, um, I'm quite surprised we've got so far into this without mentioning one belt, one road. Um, tell me, it's an initiative, not a strategy. Uh, it's an initiative, not a strategy. Um, I think it's much more than that. Um, in fact, I would liken it to a brand. Uh, in this sense, I think you could look upon uh, the Chinese um, government now as um, very similar in many respects to a multinational corporation. And uh, in the, uh, the rigor with which it, it decides on its uh, economic political policy and its diplomacy going outward, um, I think the Belt and Road forms effectively a brand which um, is being exploited um, to create a new paradigm for growth. I mean, everywhere we go in the world, um, everyone is looking for that you know, magic recipe for growth. 
um, you know, is there some uh, alternative to the uh, low interest rate regime, which, um, you know, frankly, I think has been proven to be a com total failure. I mean, certainly the Japanese experience uh, doesn't give one great confidence that this is going to result in, uh, in future growth. And the same policy being adopted in the European Union uh, I have the same view. I mean, it is not going to result in a resurgence of uh, European um, dynamism any, t any time soon. So um, what is behind that branding? Um, it's a vision. Um, it's a vision of a world with a secure and in interconnected infrastructure. And that, I think, is what the, uh, the Belt and Road is all about. It's, there isn't a Belt and Road ministry. There isn't a Belt and Road five-year plan. Um, unlike the, the NDRC uh, plans, which uh, we are used to in China for the, you know, every five years. Uh, this is something much grander, much more comprehensive, and, shall we say, much more open to interpretation, um, in the sense that it will mean different things in different areas. Um, I just came back last week from uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, and Armenia, and what was extraordinary there was the, um, not just the awareness, but the actual physical presence of Belt and Road initiatives. I mean, it wasn't that there were thousands of Chinese workers, you know, building roads and so on, but it was in the media. It was uh, uh, being attached to projects which were already underway, the new pipeline which is going through Georgia into, into Turkey, which is actually called, you know, now they've christened it the Belt and Road Iron Pipeline. So, um, you know, th this is branding, and it's a, a, a way in which I think um, uh, reflects, you know, China's importance on, let's call it soft diplomacy, as well as the, uh, you know, the harder type of diplomacy involved in their relations with other parts of the world. And I think it reflects also um, the fact that the center of gravity around the world um, is changing. I mean, uh, in one of the earlier panels, I think, uh, the panelists were invited to look back 20 years. Um, I would suggest we look back 2,000 years. Um, 12th century in Europe, what was Europe? It was a, 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 a totally irrelevant appendage um, on the edge of the European continent, which had very little interconnectivity with the rest of the world. Uh, the few entrepreneurs who sought to um, drive growth at that time went east because that was where wealth was. That was where the, the riches um, of the east, whether it was spices or whether it was precious uh, uh, stones, came from. And that is where they made their first fortunes. And Europe only really got transformed by the, as a result of the Mongol invasions in the 13th, 14th centuries. Um, that transformed Europe into a much more dynamic entity, which in turn, you know, led the expeditions, the uh, maritime expeditions um, to the east and created the original, uh, if you like, um, uh, connectivity between um, European uh, finance and um, manufactures and products and resources from the east. So I think, you know, we're seeing a, a reverse trend now. Um, you know, the growth, as, as Wayne said in his um, presentation, um, irrespective of what happens globally, is going to come in Asia. I mean, where you have uh, countries like Indonesia with young, um, upwardly mobile uh, populations who are all going to be driving growth, and that is going to be um, the, uh, the dynamism uh, which is going to spur, um, if you like, the next generation's uh, fortunes. It's not going to come from Europe, which is, uh, or indeed perhaps even from the United States, which seem to be so inured in their domestic uh, concerns at the moment. So I think there's a change of gravity, and um, hopefully Bank of Asia will be able to exploit that to some extent um, by you know, facilitating um, the financial resources that are required to bring a lot of these initiatives um, to fruition. And, and Hong Kong's being put quite central in that, Carson, I think. Um, could, could you tell us your views on, on the Belt and Road? And I'd, I'd also be very interested, just as a, an add-on to that, as to what BVI can do to, to play its role in it. Right. 
um, the Belt and Road historically, if, if we just go back as to how, where the Belt and Road came from, uh, 2013, it was in October when uh, Xi Jinping went to Kazakhstan and he made a speech at the Nabaya uh, Bev uh, University. And that's the first time he talked about the Belt and Road. And a couple of weeks later, he was in Indonesia. And that's where he talked about the maritime, uh, 21st century maritime Silk Road. And that's where the Belt and Road came from. But uh, to say, you know, who are the stakeholders in the Belt and Road? There are three Chinese ministries that are, um, that are over, sort of like the, uh, the uh, stakeholders in the Belt and Road. One is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, one is the MOFCOM, and one is NDLC. So you know where it all came from. It started off, I think, as a foreign, currency, foreign affairs uh, initiative. And that is uh, the uh, uh, Xi Jinping making these uh, grand statements, which are not just grand statements. These are grand visions. And I'm fairly sure those would be uh, realized. And what is the timing light? Uh, when it first started, and the uh, the NDLC or the uh, at that time the uh, Belt and Road Office then said that the uh, Belt and Road would start or started on the hundredth anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, and it will end around or mostly completed by the hundredth anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic which means that Belt and Road is expected to be mostly done by 2049. So this is, uh, this is going to be a three-decade project. And when the Western media wrote about the Belt and Road, or in those days called One Belt, One Road, One Belt, One Road was officially changed to Belt and Road, like September last year, uh, when the, uh, the, the Belt and Road office announced that in English, Henceforth, it will be called Belt and Road. So it's politically incorrect now to call it One Belt, One Road because the official name is now Belt and Road. And, the, um, and, and when Western media in those days said, uh, you know, the Belt and Road is it China's Marshall Plan, the Chinese foreign minister came out very quickly and said it's not China's Marshall Plan. You know why? Number one, the Marshall Plan has political uh, requirements attached to it. And therefore, the, the Marshall Plan never went into Eastern Europe, for example. The countries that adopted Marshall Plan had to adopt Western liberal democracy. And that was where the Marshall Plan went. And also, it only it stopped almost like after four years. Whereas the Chinese Belt and Road is a 30-year project. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, so you know, partly is for diplomatic purposes. The uh, MOFCOM is for facilitation of trade. NDLC, um, you know, China, we have, I think, about 30% on average excess capacity on most key industries the steel, the cement, the. Uh, the so, excess capacity has to be exported. So building the Belt and Road is also a way for Chinese um, goods and services. And services include the construction companies. So uh, the, uh, the purposes for the Belt and Road, you can, you know, using what ministries are involved, simplify into number one is a diplomatic initiative and for very good reason. Number two, um, uh, for commerce, to facilitate commerce. And number three, to, to deal with uh, China's internal economic structure and export of excess capacity and to enable China's overcapacity problem to be dealt with in a very, very clever way. And uh, in a way that would, and you know, the Belt and Road, uh, just now, uh, Paul asked, you know, Hong Kong is very important in this. Xi Wai Leung started what is called the Belt and Road Office uh, in August, in August this year. So the HASAL government now has a Belt and Road office with Yvonne Choi, who was uh, permanent secretary for trade and commerce, acting as head or as commissioner of Belt and Road. So Hong Kong is taking this very seriously. 
As to BVI, I was in uh, Kazakhstan, and Elise was there, and uh, you two, uh, Barbara, were there. Kazakhstan is, um, of course, uh, the uh, sort of the bridgehead into the Belt and Road, and you see the whole country being so energized by this Belt and Road initiative. And all the people I met in the BVI, these are the private equity guys, these are the uh, the sovereign wealth guys, these are the uh, the bankers, the uh, the the serious, the the important position makers. That they all say they all use BVIs. The BVI is well used in Kazakhstan, and I think across different countries on the Belt and Road as well. So the the Belt and Road itself would produce tremendous opportunities for the BVI because it's already a brand name there. It's already very well used there. Thank you. Um, at this stage, I propose to take some Q&A because I was hoping that there may be a few more during the, the discussion. If not, I've got a very exciting question. Anyone? Okay. So... Um, my next question is um, slightly not, not on the current agenda that's written down. Gentlemen, uh, US presidential elections. <laughs> okay, so let's just spend five minutes doing this because I, I had a really interesting chat with, with both of these guys on this on, on Friday. Who, who would China want to be the next president of the US? Is the camera filming? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Oh no, we can't ask people what they're going to vote. No. <laughs> okay, so it, we, we've gone. It, it's gone into quite a spectacle uh, uh, in in, in uh, the U.S. And just to set the scene, Donald Trump apparently has accused China of, of of wanting to starve the U.S. population, currency manipulation, and cheating. Um, he's also said that he's going to impose tariffs on Chinese goods. Um, this has brought Hillary Clinton uh, much closer to a kind of more extreme point of view than you might have thought that she might have. And overall, we're, we're having this kind of Washington elite versus an anti-political correctness battle that's going on. Um, gentlemen, are you prepared to say a few words? Uh, yes, I mean, to start with what Donald Trump says doesn't really matter because he would deny it a few, a few <laughs> days later. <laughs> Or he would have thought very carefully before saying so anyway. But as a, as a Chinese, and, and I'll talk about the, what the Chinese, if I think, I don't represent anyone, but what Beijing would think, and also what Moscow would think as well. Uh, Moscow, because I, I was uh, just two and a half weeks ago with a former deputy prime minister of, uh, of Russia, and very much still part of uh, Mufa and Shika, in Russia, and I asked exactly the same question, you know, what is Russia's, how does, I, I hope it's not too sensitive, how would Russia look at the two candidates? And they say, of course, it's Trump. They, they thought Trump would be quite prepared to take Crimea as a part of Russia, which to my Russian friends, of course, Crimea is always part of Russia. And that uh, Trump's position on Ukraine may not be quite as, uh, Quite as, uh, and and uh, from China as a Chinese and having some involvement with Beijing, I would definitely also think Trump will be the preferred candidate. Number one, Hillary has been the driving force before the uh, repivot to Asia, now under the Obama administration. So, and that def definitely is not something that the Chinese are very pleased about. So if Hillary becomes president, the pivot to Asia, re pivot to Asia would only become more uh, strengthened. And uh, although the devil you know better than the devil you don't know, but it's very difficult to change Hillary on her Asia-Pacific strategy, which while Trump doesn't have a policy yet, so it seems. So, and he's a businessman. I mean, do deals with businessmen. It's very difficult to do deals with Hillary, I suppose, uh, if w as a president. And also, Trump talks about refocusing on America. I mean, let, let us put all our energy into refocusing 
on America, why should the Chinese mind? Rather than, ha than having Americans uh, uh, playing, doing, doing a lot out here in Asia, why should the Chinese mind, and why should the Chinese mind about whatever here in the American president, it really is not, not of China's, uh, China's concern. So, uh, but I'm not saying this just out of imagination. The BBC had an, uh, one of the uh, news reports out of Beijing and Trump, uh, and, and Moscow on exactly this question. Uh, you know, how would the rest of the world look at the two uh, candidates? And the BBC correspondent in Moscow said Trump, and the BBC correspondent in Beijing said, uh, said Trump as well. So I think that is also how foreign correspondents from BBC uh, in, those, in those capitals see how the leadership is seeing the, the, the situation. I've not got great history of predictions this year, though, unfortunately, at the BBC. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Alistair, do you have any comments to add? <laughs> what, what's the question you'd like to ask the audience? Well, I mean, how many of you uh, had, had that same uh, approach to the, um, to the election in the US? I mean, how many of you would have um, made the same supposition that Trump would be the preferred candidate? I mean, perhaps a show of hands. <laughs> okay, this is not who you are voting for, just no, no, to be very, very clear. This is who, who do you think is likely uh, to be the favoured candidate if, if there were to be such a thing in Moscow or in Beijing. So for those, um, should we hands up for Hillary? There's a few, yeah. maybe five. Han hands up for Trump. <laughs> oh. well, yeah. Okay. Even, there's quite a lot of undecideds There's a there. lot of undecideds. <laughs> <laughs> But I, th I think Carson is right. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think, um, you know, uh, you have two <coughs> sort of mercantile republics um, face to face, and uh, they can trade. And the reality is it's probably much easier to do a deal with somebody like Trump than it is with Hillary, who comes from a much more ideologically um, firm stance. And, uh, you know, it's hard to see how she would not continue the policy of what certainly in China is considered the, the containment of China, whether it's by the sort of military alliances or whether it's by the attempt to uh, create the TPP as a sort of counterbalance to the uh, Belt and Road. Um, in all those aspects, you know, uh, she's seen as uh, more of a threat than an opportunity. Great. On that note, are there any more questions? What was their answer, Elise? It's quite surprising, given what he said, I suppose. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank very much um, Carson and Alistair for their um, very well-considered insights on this. Uh, I hope you feel as though it's all been very beneficial as well, and I'd like you to uh, put your hands together for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.